you need reinforcement in your walls. On reinforcement masonry doesn't work in hurricanes, sorry, in, in earthquakes. They're not expected to survive. On reinforced masonry walls are not expected to survive. No code uh, allows them. No code anywhere in the world allows them. Actually, we also need another one here. We expect, well, for external walls, these have to be spaced at two feet centers. Look at that, two feet. But you need vertical and horizontal reinforcement for a wall. Vertical and horizontal reinforcement. And that's it, that's the horizontal reinforcement, brick force. And you'll normally find it on the site, uh, on the ground, when the house is finished. <laughs> <laughs> this is fellow here. And nowhere in here is a brick force, but there it is, if you can see it. It's right there, it's on the ground. He has it there for comfort. He's, he doesn't, not to show what he used for, but it gives him some comfort to know he's there. And if they go and put marfil in here, he's used to reinforce the marfil. That's inefficient. You don't need to reinforce marfil. But it's there, not in here. <coughs> now, notice the fellow here. Um, he's a mason. And he has one rebar in this block. Mm -hmm. So we really need to brace these corners. These corners need to be braced, otherwise they shackle up. So you need a rebar here and a rebar here. So he has one. Here's a close up there. So he has one bar. One is better than none. <laughs> but when the code is very clear, you need three. You need three. If you want the house to survive the hazard, you need three. This fellow has three. That's good, but really all of these should be grouted, otherwise you get this, these stones going in. He has one, but he's grouted three. Others, he's grouted four actually. But partial knowledge is just as bad. You need rebar in here. He only has rebar in one. So he has it in one, and not in here. And this is typically what you'll find. Here, uh, he has used stones and cement and no sand. Uh, so the grout is not, it's not proper grout, it's useless really. So grouting, so even though you have enough walls and you have reinforcement, you still need to grout so that it's properly done. Because you can have a good 10 foot shear wall, you can have vertical reinforcement, but if you don't grout it, then you still have an unreinforced wall. So you're really supposed to grout every three courses. One, two, three, four grout in the core, in, in the core. One, two, three, four grout. One, two, three, four grout. One, two, three, four grout. The fellas normally go all the way to the ring beam, and then they try to use the stiff, the relatively stiff concrete that you use to pour the slab, I mean the, the beam, and try to force it down into the hole. That's what they do. But it usually gets clogged up in here, so that down here then you see the rebar is still there. <laughs> And that's it clogged up in the top. Mm -hmm. Here, some try to force it down, um, but they can't cover it completely because it's stiff. It's not like grout, which is supposed to be more fluid and flows down. And that's what you do every three courses. Three courses, grout, so you can check, yes, it's good, and go another three courses because it's, it's vulnerable to this blockage. Otherwise, you have the rebar corroding, and it corrodes. Air, moisture, salts get uh, steel. The only thing that happens is it corrodes and it grows until there is nothing left. And therefore you have an unreinforced wall. Unreinforced and ungrouted. Unreinforced walls do not, are not expected to survive earthquakes. So, regardless of where we inspect, could be a hotel, hospital, villa, um, house, uh, commercial building, you find the same thing. The grout, where it's really, conc really concrete, plugged up, plugged up, and inside the rebar corroding away. No rebar at all. Sorry, the rebar is there, but no grout at all. It's trying to do it from the top, but it clogged up. And there it is, rebar. So give that 10 years, and then, well, actually, you don't even need 10 years. It's basically unreinforced. Even though you have reinforcement there, you need the grout to truly reinforce the wall. If you just have a rebar sticking there, that's basically an unreinforced wall. Now, the case of the missing wall rebars. Um, 
It seems whenever you go to the site, <laughs> the contractor will say, yes, there is rebar there. I know it's there. And I go and inspect and you can't find it. It's hiding. And even the homeowner will come out and say, yes, I saw it there. I actually saw the rebar. I saw it. And the steel vendor will say, yes, it was there. Um, but for some reason, when I go there, it's not there. And I figured out what happened. Um, this is a battle board. Oops. Yeah. This is a battle board and you need three nails in it. The problem is that the fellas usually put in one nail. One nail. When you put in one nail, this is what happens. Um, before you get to that, so this is a house then. You come in, kitchen, dining, living room. And these are the walls. So the first thing you do when you're planning, when a contractor does, or you should do when he's planning, is to put in these grid lines on paper. Put these grid lines on paper and make sure they has enough information to set it out like this. Once he has enough information, then he transfers that onto the site and he builds these battle boards and he puts a nail in the middle of the wall so he can pull. But I recommend that you put three nails, put three nails, because if you just put one nail, the mason, right, so you need three nails, but the mason will tend to really want it at the end because he's going to line up his block. And the steel vendor thinks, oh, I guess it's the middle. It's not the middle. <laughs> it's the end. So he went and put his rebar along the line um, on the bottom board. But it's only one nail. And then the trades fellows come out, the electrician, they come out on the weekend maybe, and no one's, he doesn't, there's no one there to ask. So he just assumes that the one nail means the middle, but it's not. It's the edge. So he, instead of that being inside, it's on the outside. And the plumber as well. The plumber is of like inside is outside. Everybody gets it wrong. Why? Because of a few cents, a couple of cents. A nail. Why not just put in three nails? No, you can't put in three nails. That's basically three nails. Two cents? So, we instead have to cut off all these, and therefore the wall is unreinforced. Even though you know, if you're the homeowner, you went on the site and you saw they had rebar. But you, did, you weren't there when they cut it off. So you have all these houses now with no rebar in whatsoever. Here it is, it's all on the outside. <laughs> and they will just come and cut it off. <laughs> Therefore you have an unreinforced wall. Unreinforced masonry walls are not expected to survive earthquakes at all. They are tombs. They are tombs. Uh, you just use them temporarily as houses, but they are tombs when the earthquake comes. So, the electrician has to go and jack out here and bend the pipe and maybe uh, it can't fit, so he has to go and put some more pipes in. There's no human uh, toilet that can fit this. <laughs> so it should be out four inches. So you got to jack up all this floor and weaken the structure to try and get um, the toilet in. So you do is weaken the structure. No, you're not there when this happens. You're not there if you're the homeowner. Um, but great damage is being done to your structure. So, um, you probably, oh, so the good news and bad news. The bad news is you probably don't have a lot of rebar in your walls if you, if you own the house. The good news is you can put them in after the fact. So, um, you measure across and here is where it should be. So you saw cut a four inch uh, wide gap, a slot. Uh, you drill in about two inches, not more than that. You roughen the base. And you put in the rebar, put in the rebar, and then pour the grout every three courses. And you do that. Um, next thing, you have cracked wall. So you may have a wall, it may be well reinforced. So you have your wall, it's reinforced properly, it's grouted properly, but you still get cracks in your wall. So you get cracks. The reason why you get cracks is usually is a foundation problem. A loss of support and therefore you get these kind of cracks in buildings. And there's a crack there. Therefore, the, the wall is separated. So cracks happen in walls for various reasons. Here we have uh, the foundation um, material, and it's fairly weak on the top. It's weathered, it's weathered rock. So we have well cemented rock here, but the top is weathered, and therefore it will collapse onto some weight. So we usually recommend let the excavator come out and collapse and break up the top part of the rock, and therefore it's not going to collapse. In your house is on. 
Also, when you are doing your footings, it's a good idea to sweep the area, sweep it where the um, rebar is going. And then you may find a fissure or a fracture. There's a two inch one, major, major fracture. And many of the houses that we inspect, we find these. The thing is that if you don't clean this, then you don't see them, and therefore you don't know. This one here, you got the fellow to clean it, took a rebar and hammered it in about seven feet into the ground. It only stopped because it curved at the end, they it stopped. But, so you need to get these foundations designed properly um, because you're on a, a fracture. So the fellows leave the mud in, and you should really get that out. Any pockets of clay, that should come out. You may be on a sinkhole, you want to make sure you have 10 feet of solid rock, but if you're on a sinkhole, um, that could be a problem for you, so you usually recommend to people, um, dig the well first. Before you do any, before you pour any concrete, dig your well first to find out what you have there. And you may find, if you look inside, between 11 and 1 o'clock, you can see all the way to the bottom, the sun is shining, and you can see any fractures or fissures or voids inside of here. And if you see one, then you need to get some engineering advice. Blown tiles, um, this is uh, epidemic, <coughs> pandemic, I'm not sure what the actual word is, uh, but a wave of these things happening, a wave of them. Uh, it's, it's almost, if you have a house, this will happen. If the house is built in the last 20 years. Why? Well, the fellas usually go and find rock, and then they put marl fill on top of the rock. They find the rock, and Jesus is very clear, build on the rock. And the fellas decide, well, I'm going to put marl fill on that rock and build on the fill. The building code is very clear, do not do that, ever, unless an engineer tells you you can do it. It is too risky. You build on the rock, because the rock isn't going to settle, but this is going to settle. Or you're probably going to leave in um, layers of bad material. So you have the, the marl fill there, and leave it in the mud. And it's common, look, you fellow here doing it. You go probably doesn't see it. Why do they do this? Uh, they're just doing the best they know how to do. Um, but this is not good. So eventually you can see this will settle. It will compress. It's, it's mud. It can only compress. <coughs> Who doesn't think this will compress? Oh, very good. If you, think, if you don't think it will compress, uh, there's a nice busted Jenkins there. <laughs> but this is mud. Mud will compress. You know, even wet mud, you step in it and it compresses. You know, right? It's worse when you actually put the footing on the mud. There's just all sorts of cracks in the wall. Um, so then they build the, they put the bar fill up there, and they compact only the top layer. If you're compacting marfil, you should compact it every eight inches, so every block were height. Eight inches, eight inches, eight inches. That's where you should compact. So you put it down, compact it eight inches. Another layer, compact it eight inches. Another layer, compact it eight inches. The fellas usually dump the whole thing in there and compact just the top. So this will eventually get compacted, eventually. It may take uh, five, <laughs> ten years, but it will get compacted. And when it does, the floor will settle and the tiles will pop up. If you have a suspended floor and the tiles are popping up, it means that the floor thickness was too thin. Instead of it being, say, six inches, the fellow only did maybe five inches. So the thickness is too weak. Ah, there you go. So weak columns, beams, and slabs. This is uh, a major concern. Um, these are the lowest paid employees on the site, the labor. And these fellows are responsible for the strength of your beams and columns and slabs. These critical elements, um, the strength of them are dependent upon these fellows getting the mixture right. And they normally do. When you go in there in the morning, they get it, they get it right. But by 10, 11 o'clock, the sun is beaming on the head, then they start to get it wrong. And <laughs> you then have a weak beam or a weak column, and then you get the cracks. Um, so my recommendation, or the concrete, for columns, beams, and slabs where you have a higher measure of quality control. Or watch these fellows and have some system. Usually I recommend to small contractors, let them count. So like a, a one, two, four mix. This fellow would say, one 
uh, well, he puts in the, the, the concrete, the, the cement. I mean, he's counting the sand. He said one sand, and then he said one sand. Uh, he put in two sand, and he drops in two sand. He says three sand, and he says three sand. And then he says four sand. He says, oh, hold up, it's only supposed to be three. And then he goes one stone, one stone, two stone, two stone. So the count, so that the foreman isn't doesn't have to watch them all the time. He could be up somewhere else on the site, but he can hear them. And as he hears eight stone, he knows, oh, hold up, we can't <laughs> use that. Let's use that for you know some <laughs> sidewalk. I don't know. But I <clears throat> waste it, but we can't put that in the building. Question. Yes. What what's the mixture of uh, uh, how much sand are cement? Uh, I usually recommend uh, one, one and a half, three. One cement, one cubic meter, one cubic foot of cement, which is one bag of cement, yeah. to one and a half cubic feet of sand. Three of sand? Oh, no, in buckets. Well, I could put that, we do that in the course, and I convert it all to buckets. I uh, can't remember it now, but I can put it on the website so you can get it. But, yeah, well, as I said, I know in cubic feet, um, but I've done the calculation for the cubic meters, sorry, for the buckets, but you don't keep that in my head. <clears throat> but you basically want a one, one and a half, three, which is a 3750 PSI concrete, um, fairly strong for columns, beams, and slabs. You can use a weaker one for footings and for ground floor slabs. But if you're using columns, beams, and slabs, those have to be strong. Yeah. And then you send the fellow and pour the concrete. Um, this here now, reinforcing bars is fairly critical. Bar should be bent around safe bending diameters. So normally the fellows bend it around this cleat on the site. All over the Caribbean they bend it around a cleat. Here it is, he's bent it uh, very proudly. He's bent it basically to the point of failure. So this is the minimum curvature for the rebar. The minimum. And here it is, this is, is worse than the minimum. So all this bar is damaged. All these bars are damaged. Now why do we bend rebar? We bend rebar because we want to connect, generally, the structural elements together. We want to connect your slabs to your columns, or sorry, your slabs to your beams, and your beams to your columns, and your columns to your footing, your footing to the wall. So you want to connect your structural elements together. That's why you bend them. They're connectors. They're connectors. But if you take your connector and you bend it to the point of failure, then during the earthquake, then these areas are stressed and you know it collapses. So a lot of stress occurs here. 